So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Paula Curtis and this is my husband Jack and we're here today with Wes Taylor to talk a little bit about his science-based training that he's been doing. He's out in Utah and for the last 10 years he's been working with wild mustangs uh, himself and his wife Cammie on their on their ranch and we're going to hear a little bit more about his methods and the things that he, he's learned. So welcome today yeah, Wes. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys for having me, man. It's a, it's a pleasure to be a part of your group and uh, with your network. So thanks for having us. Yeah. Well, you're welcome. It's been great, great to have you on board. So tell us a little bit about your story and how you got into um, the science-based horsemanship and what that's done for you in your training of the Mustangs and, and that sort of thing. Absolutely. I'll try to kind of box it down into the, the Reader's Digest version, but Basically, uh, uh, 10 years ago, in kind of 08 and 09, I had a pretty kind of hard reality check in my life, and I, my business and what I was doing quickly got gobbled up in that financial crisis that we had in you know, 08 and 09. And so, as recovering from that, I was really just thinking, I don't want to get back into business. I want to do something, something that's more fulfilling, you know, something that just I don't just I didn't want to get back into my old business of what I was doing. So somehow I found my way to uh, adopting a couple of wild horses, some Mustangs. And at the time, I wasn't I was by no means a trainer or and I knew nothing about horses other than, you know, I can sit on a horse and kind of look good and head down the trail and I could do right and left. You know, I could get around, but I wasn't a trainer or, or didn't want to be. But I, I found myself with a lot of time on my hands because I'd lost my business. We'd had to, you know, move out of our house. We, we couldn't afford to live in the house that we were in anymore. And so we, we were really, my wife and I and my family were going through a, a, a pretty significant <laughs> kind of reset in life. And uh, so we ended up at my, uh, my grandfather's ranch property. He had recently passed away. So we were able to work out a deal with the family to move into his house and, and kind of live there. And so I went and as, as, as any good uh, horse person should start out, right? A, a really green horse person should go adopt a really wild horse. That's a super, super way. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. No, I'm kidding. Wait, you're not the only one that's done that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But that, that's what happened. Um, I, I was just really kind of lost in my life. and didn't know what I wanted to do. And I just decided I wanted to do something with horses. And that just, I always felt good when I was around horses. So I thought, I don't know what I want to do, but... I just want to stay with horses. Let me find that. And so I adopted these two wild horses from the BLM and brought them back to my grandfather's place. And, and honestly, in all honesty and all fairness to, to horsemen everywhere and to the horse, I spent an entire year just hanging out with those wild horses, just trying to figure out how do we do this? How, how do we create this relationship? How do we come together and, and, you know, not kill each other and not get hurt and not be scared? And how does this work? And, and honestly, I, I struggled and struggled for a long time. I did what everybody else does, right? We go watch some YouTube videos and like, oh, hey, there's a little something. And, and then I'd go try that out with the horse. And, and then I'd go watch another YouTube video and go, oh, I'd go try that out. And so that was kind of my, uh, my evolution of learning and that went on for, for five years. Um, I just spent those five years just really trying to figure things out. And then I, I come across a guy by the name of Dr. Steven Peters and he's a neuroscientist. And so this is where I kind of got the science starting to come into play. And he's a, uh, he's a human brain doctor. So he, he specializes in, in human brains and functionality and he spent his entire career working on that. But he also has a passion and a love for horses and specifically even Mustangs. And so I kind of bumped into him and, you know, we got together and, and had some conversations and he started to share with me a little bit about how the equine brain works from a scientific standpoint. And that just started to change everything. The more info I got from him, the more I was really experimenting and playing with that. And so that was, that was about five years ago from today. And so for the last five years, I've really been you know, exploring and perfecting and understanding this science, you know, what Dr. Peters says this, and then I would go home and apply that to the horse and try to, you know, get inside my horse's brain, so to speak, and, and figure out what that meant. And anyway, so it's been five years of, of exploring that. And then in the last uh, three years, Dr. Peters and I have been 
kind of co-presenting at some different horse expos and fairs and, and summits that way with the, with his research and my application of it. And so that's, that's kind of a quick story of how we got to where we are today. And, and to now I've, I've designed my own kind of horsemanship program based off of that scientific knowledge of what's happening at a, a neurochemical level in the horse. You know, what's, what, what's their autonomic nervous system doing? How's it reading what's going on? And then applying, you know, pressure, release, timing, rhythm, balance, all of that still applies into it. But I'm just following a lot more from a scientific uh, neurochemical what's going on in that horse's head. So, right. That's, that's kind of how we got here. So, yeah. It's great. It is great. How yeah. cool. And, and so what have been your biggest like aha moments when you started making this shift from what you were doing to applying the science to your horses and, and what changes did you notice as you started, started applying these things? Uh, for sure. And one, one of the, you know, Dr. Peters would, would share information with me. And one of his things he would always say is don't just believe me take this home and go ask your horse, you know, go, go do this with your horse and let your horse tell you what's really going on. And then, you know, that's so some of the biggest aha moments or what I've really learned from this is understanding and reading the horse so much better, so much more subtly. And what we've kind of come down to as far as a, you know, the, the pinpoint or what is the real thing here is, Every horse is just constantly asking the question, you know, neurochemically in their mind from an instinctive base, am I safe? That, that question is just a constant, everything that we're doing with the horses, that's the constant neurochemical question in the horse's mind is, am I safe? So one of the biggest ahas that, that I've kind of got out of this is me being able to influence those chemicals in the horse's brain to answer that question so that the horse can say, I am safe. And then we can go to the next thing. But then the question comes up again. And now we got to answer it again. And so really, it's, it's just become a series of how can I answer that question effectively enough times to where this horse, you know, the caution comes down, you know, the curiosity starts to come up, and, and the, then things start to really work from there. So discovering that one thing of am I safe and then being able to answer that at a neurochemical level not from a mechanical level meaning you know do this maneuver do that maneuver those those are part of it but understanding the chemistry change in the brain is is what really makes that happen and then yeah. a couple of chemicals that end up it, that we're working with like cortisol is, is stress and worry, and that's in the sympathetic nervous system. So us humans, we work the same way. That's, that's probably even one of the bigger ahas is, is we're now applying this into human relationships, and my wife and I are talking all the time, and I, it, she has the same question. Am I safe? Right. Right, so whatever we're doing, and, and I'm, I'm, so I'm kind of asking that same question of myself and with my wife or the people that I'm working with. We all have that same question in life. Am I safe? And so I'm just learning to answer that more and more for the horses and now also with, with us humans. So cortisol is stress and worry, sympathetic nervous system. And then with horses, that's where the reactions live. You know, they like to hang out with when they're stressed and worried and the horse is anxious. That's when the reactions come to the surface. When we can transition the horse into the parasympathetic nervous system, rest, relax, restore, you know, when, when their, their stomach's turned on and they're relaxed, then that's where the horse can be so much more responsive, right? Difference between reactions and responses is, is huge. And the difference between those two is answering the question, am I safe? Because if the horse can be answered, am I safe? I'll get a response. If the horse can't answer, am I safe? We get a reaction. <laughs> Neurochemically, to me, that's just huge because now it takes, it takes me, the trainer, out of the way. It takes kind of the horse out of the way. Now we're just dealing with neurochemicals. And yeah, no, that's, that's, really it, it just cool. flows. Right. It's really cool because I think that's so truth, truthful or, you know, that, that, that's such a deep truth in any relationship is that safety factor. And when you're safe, be it with somebody or with your horse feeling safe with you, now you can have true meaningful conversation. But oh. if you, if you are in a place where you're trying to be protective and you're just, 
taking care of self, right? Self-preservation. And that can be a little bit of self-preservation or a lot, depending on the situation, yes. right? But but there's not the depth of the conversation cannot be there. What comes out of the conversation is not going to be nearly as much if that safety is in question. Right. And I mean, yeah. and so many great horsemen, what are they always talking about? Self-preservation, a horse, right? So this you're putting the science explanation behind it where this is something that's known. You're just explaining it more from a science level. And I mean, I would say on, uh, on one side, you've got reaction and on one side, you've got reasoning. And so you yes. want to bring that horse over to the reasoning side. So we're always talking about trying to get their mind, but you're explaining sort of the science and sort of the chemical end behind the reasoning side. Uh, so it's Absolutely. To hear that. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. I, I, right on Jack. I think that's, probably one of the biggest things I hear even from my clients or the people that I work with or if I'm presenting somewhere, the science just kind of adds the common sense to what we've heard a lot in, in horsemanship, right? There's lots of little phrases that are kind of magical rhythms and rhymes that we, we have a feel of what that is, but might not totally understand what that means. But that's a perfect example, Jack, of what you said, that the reasoning side, the reasoning side is, the parasympathetic nervous system. There you you know, the horse just got a release of dopamine and some serotonin, which brings the horse into a, you know, a relaxed, more engaging type conversation with us. So science just puts some good common sense meaning behind all of these. Uh, Same. I kind of, I kind of get around that, that the science takes the, the whispering out of horse whispering and it just makes it into common sense. And that's the fun part, I think, is it really just does add that to it. Exactly. And then also people tend to personify their horse because they, they think horses are like themselves, if that makes sense. And so again, the science behind it sort of gets people to understand these horses aren't necessarily, there are some similarities between humans, but they're not people either. And so here's what's going on. And now you have a better way to go at this and sort of teach this and understand this. So I like that. I like that concept as well. Absolutely. There's, there's a lot of similarities and then as probably even more important is really understanding how we're different so that we can get us humans out of the way, right? Because we can get kind of two in the way thinking, you know, if we anthropomorphize too many things onto our horse, right. oh boy, now we're really getting in the way. You know, we're yes. really causing the breakdown in communication rather than building that communication. And, you know, another uh, kind of key factor that, that, science is really proving with the horses that has really helped to understand and help my clients a bunch is that the horse's brain operates from a standpoint of everything is a proven, everything is a threat until proven otherwise. Sure. So we might go walking up to our horse with the same saddle blanket right, that we've used for the last 25 days, but your horse can't reason. They, they can't think forward in time to know and look and go, Hey, that's the same saddle blanket that Jack brought out yesterday. I am safe, right? Their, their brain doesn't work that way. <laughs> they see you coming with the saddle blanket and all they see is pressure. And the question pops up, am I safe? Well, when we can slow down, right? And you guys talk about this. We all do as horsemen, you know, the more we can slow down. So if we can slow down and let that horse have an experience, right? The, the whiskers or the vibrisi that are on the muscle of our horses, Every one of those, those are called vibrisi, and every one of those has its own separate blood supply and has its own nerve cells going to them. So when we come up with that saddle blanket, if we'll just pause for a moment and let that horse get curious, you know, and just touch that saddle blanket, you know, we hear a lot that they want to smell the saddle blanket. Well, they smelled it, you know, 25 feet away, but when it's up close right there, those vibrisi, they want to touch because those whiskers, those vibrisi is how they, you know, is this rough, smooth, hot, cold, prickly, alive, dead, squishy, you know, what is this thing? And once they can kind of have that touch with those vibrisi, then that question can get answered. Right. And you'll watch your horse will pause for a moment, and then they'll lick and chew. If you wait a little minute, they'll lick and chew. Right. And that licking and chewing is that transition back to the parasympathetic nervous system. The stomach gets turned back on. The salivatory glands get activated in the mouth, and that causes that licking and chewing. And that's a great indicator 
that your horse is transitioning into that parasympathetic, you know, the reasoning side, the responsive side, the thinking side of the brain, you know, all of those things that we have in the industry, science is just able to tell us, okay, the horse is, you know, the stuff got turned back on because when you're in fight flight mode, you don't need, your body doesn't need to worry about, hey, let's digest, you know, the last 10 pounds of hay we just ate. No, your body's in fight flight. Let's get the heck out of here. And so when your horse can relax and get back onto that reasoning side, like you said, Jack, that's that licking and chewing and they calm down or they'll take a big breath, they'll lower their head, their ears will lay back a little bit, their eyes get softer. All of those things is the horse coming back into a relaxed state of, I am safe. Right. And then serotonin, and then serotonin really starts to happen right there. And that serotonin balances the emotions in the horse. And I'm not going to go deep into how many emotions the horse has. I'm pretty simple. They're either fearful or they're safe. Those are kind of where I hang out because that's pretty simple. Yeah. So that serotonin balances emotions in the horse. And that's where the horse can transition and get a lot safer in its mind and a lot less fearful. But as you guys know, that takes time, right? We've got to slow down a little bit. We've got to pause for 30 seconds or two minutes or whatever that is and let that transition happen. And then that's, so that's how those chemicals can really work for us and kind of how they can work against us. Right. Right. Yeah. I love it because that, that explain, or you, you sort of went into the direction I was going to ask with licking and chewing and, and even things like, um, when people always say horse knows when the electric fence is turned on, how do they know? And I'm like, well, they sense it. Right. But you've got into why, you know, and how that works. And that's just that that helps people understand why horses are as perceptive as they are. And I think uh, they're it's great. Yeah. Right. They're, they're extreme. And, and, you know, that that question in their mind of, you know, everything is a, is a threat until proven otherwise. When we can really take a look at that, because us humans, yeah. we got we got this prefrontal cortex, right? This is where we we label things. We plan things. We have expectations. We have judgments. You know, we had a million words that we put on things and we, you know, we say what things are. Horses don't have any of that. So anytime something is new in their environment, it's just a simple question. Am I safe? Period. You know, that's it. Right. But we just got to kind of get out of the way and let them have that time to find that answer and, and relax to it. So, right. Right. Yeah. And I like how you use it just as that one simple question, because I think it's so overwhelming if we if we start to take in too many ideas and perspectives on where the horse is at and that is so true it's like that is their main question am i safe yeah. what that question is answered it really opens up the door to a lot of possibilities in your training and your communication and what you can do with your horse and and i think that's that's really cool that you you talk about you know just answer that question am i safe and then i love how you say take the time because that's uh, a factor that's really hard. And now that we're all in quarantine, I think a lot of people are finding themselves with a little more time. Which absolutely. You know, I, I had a client just, just last week call me and she says, West, I can't, I can't get my horse, you know, down the road away from my barn. And uh, so anyway, I went out to her place there and she, she's talking to me and explaining the setup. And she goes, well, I don't know if she's afraid of, you know, my neighbor's car up there or, you know, the, the trash cans that are over there on that side of the house. And, and then there's the dog up there that's barking, you know, and she's like, I'm not sure what it is that she's afraid of. And I said, well, let's let's back this up and, and let me watch what you do and, and we'll go from there. And and so what she started to do was just kind of quickly saddle up. You know, she was just brushing and throwing the saddle on and getting ready to go and was going to head up the road. And I said, oh, OK. <laughs> Great. Let's back this up a little bit. I want you to watch me saddle up your horse now. And I, I would slow down and take a break in between each thing. I'd brush four or five strokes on that side of the horse and then back up and just stand there and wait a minute. Sure enough, that horse would put its head down and lick and chew and I'd do the other side. So what the difference between her and I was, I was answering that horse's question every step. I wasn't waiting till I got up the road to the pressure point to find out I could see that that horse had questions all along the way. So we just slowed everything way down and that horse licked and chewed. I, I count how many times a horse licks and chews in, in all of my trainings or whatever I'm doing. And you know, that horse licked and chewed about 15 times before I got the saddle on. And when she did it, that horse licked and chewed zero times before the saddle got on. So she was getting on a much more worried horse 
a horse that hadn't had the question answered of am I saved? And she was gonna ready to head down the road. Well, I'd answered that question kind of, so to speak, 15 times before I got in the saddle. And so when we started headed down the road, as you can imagine, we, we had different experiences. Her horse was you know, very cautious about heading down the road. And by the time I got the horse headed down the road, that horse was like, man, I already know I'm safe. Where are we going? And then we could just start going down the road. But you know, her, her, her brain, she was kind of talking about human brains. She was identifying, you know, is it the car? Is it the dog? Is it the garbage cans? Right. And the horse can't logically think it, but the horse is scared of everything, right? So it, it's everything. Yeah. But if that horse can feel safe, then it's nothing. Exactly. And so it was yeah. a huge kind of aha for her to go, oh my gosh. So if I start with my horse nice and calm and relaxed, I'll get where I'm going nice and calm and relaxed. <laughs> That's the idea. Yes, that's that's what we want to have here, right? And we want us humans to be nice and calm and relaxed as well, because as you guys know, our horses will they'll, they'll they read us, right? They they read us at a, at a core kind of energetic level, because again, everything's a threat until proven otherwise, including us. So if I'm anxious and worried about riding my horse down this road and I'm like oh my gosh it's the garbage can I know my horse is going to have a meltdown at the garbage can oh your horse felt that as soon as you had that thought your horse is like we're worried <laughs> oh my gosh what's the problem down the road okay I agree let's be really worried and then all of a sudden everything is a concern right <laughs> so right, <laughs> right they, they connect a lot with us and it, it makes a huge difference in our cortisol levels, our stress levels, right? That's why horses are so good at therapy is, is they really connect with where we are, not where we say we are, right? And that's, that's, that's kind of the anthropomorphic side too is we'll even tell ourselves, oh, hey, no, I'm fine. I'm good. Today's, I'm, I'm so relaxed. And then, right, we go out with our horse and boom, we have all these problems. Now we weren't really relaxed either. We, we weren't in that calm, quiet place that we wanted our horse to be at. Exactly. The real, yeah. the real, the horse is real and they tell us how we are that day. And maybe that's why we're all attracted to horses because it's, it's real. Yeah. Right. And they yeah. don't, and horses really don't, they really don't lie. Right. You know exactly where they are that day, where they stand that day yeah. and yeah. It makes so much sense. And you know, people will say something like, well, a horse never forgets. If you have a bad experience, that horse doesn't forget. And, I'll tell people, I'll say, well, I think of it like the horse has an emotional memory. Now, I'm probably oversimplifying that statement, and you could probably, you know, you're going way more in depth in regards to that sort of emotional memory, but that's just an easy way for me to explain to people um, how, that, how that works and how horses do remember, but maybe they don't, they don't remember that exact experience in pictures. They just might remember the way they felt about that person then. Oh. Right. So they see 20 years exactly. later and there it is again, there's the feelings again, and that emotional memory comes, comes back to the horse. But I, 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 I appreciate the way you explain. Absolutely. I, I see that in, and trailer loading is, is one of those experiences that you know, if, if, if a horse has struggles with, with trailer loading for whatever reason, the first time, and, and I, unfortunately I, I see this or I hear this a lot that, well, we just need more pressure right, to get that horse into the trailer. So then I see, you know, we, we might run the rope up through the trailer and, and, and out and, and, you know, tie it off onto something. Or I, we might see two, three, five people, you know, behind the horse, like pressure, you know, and, and really trying to just push that horse into the trailer because our human mind works, says this, right? The human mind says, oh, well, if the horse would just get in the trailer, he would see that it's safe and fine. Right. That's that's the human logic, because we can think forward in time. So our mind says, oh, we just got to get him in the trailer and, and then he'll see that it's fine. I've got hay in there. There's water in there. I've got treats in there. I've, I've got all these things. that will be great. And he's just got to get in there and experience that. Right. <laughs> that's the human side. Yes. And then here's the horse. The horse walks up to it and is like a dark scary yeah. cave full of predators no way am i going in there right so your horse stops you know 10 feet 15 feet 25 feet from the trailer wherever wherever the brain trips into caution and says i'm not safe so that's where the horse's feet will stop right so from that point on it's just a matter of answering that that question of safety so this emotional memory that you're talking about jack so 
if we just pressure that horse into the trailer and then we get back out and then the next time we come up, it's like, well, this horse is, is really hard to trailer load. You know, I need two or three people and he's getting better, but you know, we still got to have four or five people to get him in. And that horse just keeps getting pressured into the trailer. You're exactly right. What ends up happening is that horse starts associating. So it starts walking up to the trailer and it's like caution feet stop. And then it's like, Oh yeah, I've been here before. This is where the pressure gets turned up and up. So the horse just automatically, the nervous system just starts building pressure and, and cortisol, stress and worry. And then for sure, every time that horse gets presented with that same kind of a visual setup, right? Every time that horse gets asked to walk into an ambush, walk into a cave, walk into a, you know, a slot canyon, its mind just says, oh my gosh, and now a whole bunch of pressure is going to come. And then we do what we do. And sure enough, a whole bunch of pressure comes. And the horse is like, I knew it. I knew that pressure was going to come. And so they just build and build and build. Right. And then that's, like you're saying, Jack, that's how that, so that neurochemistry just kind of starts to get recorded in, in the horse's mind. And so when the horse starts feeling stressed and worried, instead of down-regulating or self-regulating and coming down, the horse feels that pressure and starts up-regulating because that's what we've taught it, right? Because we keep adding more pressure. So, so that's, that's how that emotional memory starts happening. It's not that the horse looks at it and goes, oh, and now I'm going to have, you know, five yahoos behind me push me in this trailer. The horse just says, I feel pressure. And when I feel pressure, what works? Mother Nature says, worry more. And so then more and then more and then more. And to where that becomes that horse's emotional pattern. And then they just keep doing that over and over and over. The really cool part is we can take science and walk that horse up to the trailer and wherever their feet stop, right? Wherever caution gets them to stop. If we'll just wait and slow down right there and let that horse lower its head a little bit, maybe it'll lick and chew, right? We'll get back into that parasympathetic nervous system. We're teaching that horse to self-regulate. Maybe we can take a couple more steps and then the horse's head comes up and we're cautious again. We'll slow that down, let them lick and chew. So we can build the same emotional patterns. Let's just build it in a very relaxed emotional pattern. So if we do that and let that horse lick and chew and we go really slow and let curiosity start to play to where the horse is using those vibrisi to touch the side of the trailer, touch the floor of the trailer, you know, nuzzle around in there. and and I see this happening. You know, the horse puts its head down to, to touch the floor and just check that out, right? Because everything is a, a threat until proven otherwise. They're not just going to jump on the floor. They're like, I know this is safe. They want to touch it. You know, they want to have that feeling. And I see a lot of people pull the horse's head up. Don't be eating that hay in there. Don't be doing that. We're loading in the trailer. And I'm like, man, your horse was just about to answer the question of safety. He was going for the answer. And you told him no. Right. And, and so that's where I see so much of this gets stopped right there because curiosity leads to confidence. So if they can be curious and touch the floor and touch the side, you keep waiting, that horse will load itself. You know, he'll, he'll get curious enough and feel safe enough. He'll be like, I think I could go in here. Right. And sure enough, they just start loading because they can self-regulate. So that's, that's the real key part of that, Jack, of what you're saying is that emotional patterning. Are they patterned to upregulate? Or are they patterned to downregulate? We teach them both, right? It, 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 it's how they're handled is, is what puts that patterning in there. So absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well yeah. said. Yeah. 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 That's cool. And it's, it's, it's that patterning that you're talking about. So through like you did with your, your client's horse, you had how many, and we will talk about life experiences and you want to have good quality life experiences with your horse. So it's not necessarily about training, but it's about having these life experiences. And the more you have, and the horse knows they're okay, and you guys are going to be just fine. And you're never going to overexpose them. When something really big does come up, the horse looks to you and goes, well, what do you think? And you say, like, like you did with your client's horse, you're safe. Just like I said 15 times before when we were grooming and saddling, you're safe, you're safe, you're safe. So then when that is the basis of things and your horse says, am I safe? And you say, yeah, we're just fine. Your yeah. horse believes in you. And all too often, the horse starts asking that safety question, like you're your trailer example right now. 
And people either say, you know, no, you can't explore, or they say, oh, now's the time to really shove them in. And <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> I, I I see that too, and I I can almost you know the horse is just about to go in, and then oh, a bunch more pressure. Yeah, that's the thing. Go, and that's the exact opposite of what the horse's mind needs. You know, that horse is just starting to be curious, and then what he needs is just a timeout where he can go. <sighs> And lick and chew, and then that starts to reinforce, hey, I got curious, and I looked in the trailer, I leaned in the trailer, I touched the trailer, and then that, that dopamine release comes right before they lick and chew. So that licking and chewing is a, a, a body reset, right? That's the horse coming back in parasympathetic. So I really watch that licking and chewing to when I see a horse get stressed, you know, head comes up and ears get alert, and, you know, the eyes kind of pull back, and there's, there's a, a nerve that runs across the top of the eye and down the side of the face called the trigeminal nerve. And it's very much wired to the sympathetic nervous system. So when that horse gets cautious, right, that nerve starts to pull and get tight and it starts to pull the eye open, right? You've seen this, you know, when those eyes start to pull back, when you can see the whites in the eye, right? Here's kind of the old cowboys thing when, well, if you can see the whites of their eyes, you know, there's trouble. And well, now science is saying, yep, that's the trigeminal nerve pulling the eyelids back so they can gain as much light as possible and find their escape, right? That, that's what's happening internally. The horse is saying, uh, I'm in fight flight mode. Right. How do I get out of here, right? It, it, so it wants to gather light and find the, the escape. And then another part of that trigeminal nerve runs down across into the top of the, the muzzle there. And so you see, you know, really tight-lipped horses that are just really puckered and well, you know you got problems when, when you got that really tight puckered lip. Well, that's that trigeminal nerve. And so I'll watch that lip and like, oh, yeah. this horse is pretty stressed right now. Yeah. We just need to wait a minute and let's let this stress go away. And if you wait, that horse will lick and chew. And that licking and chewing, that dopamine release tells the horse's body, oh, we're relaxing. And then the body says, oh, well, if we're relaxing, I can go back to digesting breakfast. Salivatory glands get turned on, licking and chewing happens, a big breath, soft, you know, all of those things happen. And so that's, that's just the science that all of these little things that we kind of know as, as horse people, but right. now we've got science that just tells us scientifically what's happened instead of, well, great grandpa David said that, you know, if you can see the whites of the eyes, you, you know, you're in trouble. And so now we know why. That's, that's what I'm really enjoying about it. Yeah, 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 the actual science behind it. You know, yesterday we had a, a group coaching call and this this gal, she asked us about licking and chewing and she said she never sees her horses do it. And I believe she had three horses. She has four. Four horses. A few of them are in training. And she said she never sees her horses lick and chew. So I, I paused a little. And I thought about this and I said, well, are you in a hurry? Are you an energetic person? Are you, and, and it turns out she was trying to get as much done as she could in the time she had allotted. She links yeah. to the four she, like, okay. Yeah. And so, so our answer to her was, well, first of all, sit, observe. You don't always have to be working with your horse. Oh, gosh. And take time and stop. They need, the horse needs time. And it's exactly what you're saying. You're just explaining the why is and, and the reason behind that. Yeah. So I just yeah. thought it's great. So anyway. I, I, Jack, you're, you're, you're right on. And I, a story I kind of tell people is, right, I mean, we've all watched a scary movie or we've gone to the theater and, and we've watched a scary movie. What is your brain like for the next hour after right. that movie? <laughs> yeah. right. right? Right. You, you walk out of the theater, you're heading out across the parking lot. It's 1130 at night. Everything's down. It's quiet. You're walking along. And then in some little grandma car that you walk by, this cute little poodle comes up to the window and is like, yeah, 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 yeah. what do you do? Right. right? Yeah. Jump. jump out of your skin. You, you, you're like, just you ratchet, clear up in the sympathetic nervous system. You hit in an internal panic. When have we ever been attacked by a cute little poodle inside of a car with the window rolled up, right? I have never physically been attacked by that. Right. But you know what my nervous system does when that happens? Yeah, ratchets me to the top. Uh -huh. Our horses are constantly walking around like they just come out of the movie theater. Right. That's how their mind is pre-programmed. Everything is a threat until proven otherwise. Right. And so if we're hustling with our horses, we just got to know we're lighting fuses. 
Yeah. 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 Things are going to pop. Right. right. We're just light fuses. When we go really fast, we're just lighting fuses and going, well, I hope I can deal with this one. When, when these one, yeah. when that fuse goes in and blows up that little thing, I hope I'm ready. But when we can slow everything down, we actually go along and we start putting fuses out. You know, we start turning things off to where, so if I walked out of that same movie theater and let's pretend that I went into another part and I had like a, a nice calming hour long massage, right? Quiet music, little waterfall trickles. And I get this massage and I'm just all relaxed. And now I go walking out of the parking lot and that little, that dog comes up and barks at the window. I'd probably turn and be like, isn't that the cutest little poodle ever? Look at that dog in there, right? I'd have an entirely different response because I'm in the parasympathetic nervous system. I'm very relaxed and calm and confident versus being very stressed and sympathetic and like, I am ready to blow up. Right. That, that's, that's how our horses are in that nervous system. Right. right. Yeah. And it's, it's so hard for people to just understand that slowing down is actually faster in the end. You know, and initially it seems, it seems like it's just, oh, it's so slow and you're getting nowhere, but it, it makes such a difference in the speed of actually attaining your end result, whatever that might be. Absolutely. And, yeah. You touched right on it, Paul. We have a, a phrase that I use here with my trainers or whoever's kind of working with me when we're, we're going that slow down faster to get done sooner, right? So when I see somebody having trouble with their horse, the, the best advice that I can give that I know will work every time, slow down back up and count to 50 go back in and slow it down you know just slow down faster to get done sooner so what we like i said we count the licking and chewing during our entire training processes or working with clients and i'm trying to get my clients to really watch and pay attention to the licking and chewing because if i can get people to count how many times their horse licks and chews i'm getting people to be aware i'm getting their eyes to 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 pay more attention. I'm getting your ears to listen a little more because you can hear them when they lick and chew. You don't need to see it. You, you can hear it. And so as I can get my clients more tuned in and more aware, everything gets a lot calmer. And so in, in a typical hour training session, uh, a horse, you know, we're working with Mustangs, any horse really, in 60 minutes, I want on an average that horse to be licking and chewing about 30 times. So every other minute on an average is kind of the number that I'm looking for. So if I'm working with a horse that doesn't lick and chew very much, that's that horse telling me, Hey, I'm pretty chronically stressed. I'm pretty used to being stressed all the time. I've learned to tolerate pressure and cause they'll get pressured up and then just, Yes. Tolerate. They'll just hang out right there. You know, you heads up, stiff neck, cautious eye, and they're just, I can tolerate this pressure for, you know, 87 minutes until you're done and you go back in the house. Right. And then you go put them in the corral and watch that horse, oh, you know, head down, licking and chewing, and they just go through this big release. Right. And so I, I use that counting and the licking and chewing to just help me be more aware of, am I pausing enough? You know, it's been, it's been 19 minutes and we've only licked and chewed three times. Yeah. Something's a little off. I, I need to slow down more in, in between steps. So that's, that's been a fun thing that we've really had some fun with. And, and some horses, when they first get introduced to this, they've never had that opportunity to really relax with predator, right? They've never had it go that slow. Once they start feeling that it's safe to do that, oh my gosh, some of them can't stop licking and chewing. Right. And then, just, right. Yeah, constant. I, and going into a yawning state. So yesterday we were talking about how we'll get horses to, we'll get them to yawn. And sometimes three, five, I've seen horses yawn like 10 times in a row where we yeah, say, relax, uh, relax, lower your head. They yawn. Just that yeah. jaw that starts jaw working. Work, and Right. Ah, uh, so that's, that's an opioid release. And that is a huge, huge mental nervous system, right? It, it usually, you they'll get them you'll get them to start yawning after you've done some kind of been, you just had a training session or whatever it is and then you leave them alone a little longer and then that's kind of when they hit that yawning part of things and they really start just going into it yeah that's that is a huge neurochemical change in the brain and so jack i love that i mean when that starts to happen it's like time out 
don't anybody cough. We don't want, I mean, I just want the world to stop yes. spinning and just let that horse just bake, man. Let this dude just bake on this right now. This is some good stuff. So. It is. It is. And sometimes you can get, you can cause horses to do this multiple times in a row. And like the first three times it happens, people just don't notice it. But I say, look, it's going to happen again. And you might get it more, you might get it five, ten, you know, six yeah. times. You, yes. You, your cause, it's just think you're causing this to come through. And the horse has this opioid release and they yawn and they relax. And it's just amazing. And once people realize, and I love how you quantify um, licking and chewing. So you have people count so that they observe. So you're getting people to observe what's taking place. It's the same thing with yawning. They're noticing it and they see, oh my gosh, this is huge. Like you yeah. said, just everything stops. Yeah. And let's let the horse do its thing. You know, it's great. Notice though how much we have to get out of the way, right? They don't yawn and do all of that when we're in there fussing around and trying to put oh. the bridle on or dress in their forelock or whatever we're doing. They're like, what's happening, right? Yes. You have to stop, get out of their way and just create that pause, that safe play there. And then that can happen. So that is, yeah. that is gold stuff. And it really is. it isn't. It is. I'll, 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 I'll tell my clients, you know, to, to count that licking and chewing because I tell them, I says, because here's why. When you call me later and said that this horse had a problem, my first question is going to be, how many times did that horse lick and chew? And if you can't answer that question, go start over and call me back later, right? Because they weren't paying attention. They weren't being aware. They were like, well, we were working on trailer loading today and I, I, I got him up with the trailer and he almost got in and, and then he reared up and pulled back and, and, you know, give me a rope burn and he ran to the neighbor's house and stomped through their garden. It was just a terrible thing. I was so embarrassed. How many times did your horse lick and chew before you got to the horse trailer? Well, I don't know. I, I only had like 15 minutes to try to do this before I had to go somewhere. Well, yeah. there you go. No, I, I love that because, the, you know, the, the quintessential – um, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, <laughs> it answers it answers that completely because it's like, well, yeah. I'm pretty sure it wasn't all of a sudden. Right. Now you've got an awesome question. It's, well, how many times right. did you lick and chew? Yeah. That, that's my go-to, and I tell my clients that, and they're like, are you serious? And I go, you know I'm calling. Yeah. Call me, and I'll find out if I'm serious or not. And they're like, you know, my horse bucked me off. How many times did you lick and chew before he bucked you off? Well, I don't know. Yeah. Go do it again. I bet you he won't buck you off if you count, right? Because now we're <laughs> we're going to slow everything way down, and we're because yeah, I I want a horse to lick and chew. You know, I just I play around with it when I go out and catch my horse. I want him to lick and chew three to five times before I even get the halter on. And so I I've, I've gotten really good at setting up pressure and release, and then you know when we release on that prep, when we release, that's kind of telling the horse, hey, you just found the thing. You just you just did the thing, or you're starting to think the thought I'm wanting you to think, and you know we want to release on that. And then what science has added in that has helped me so much is from the time of the release until I start the next thing, whatever that is. The release begins the horse's mind in the seeking mental relief. Okay, so that horse needs to seek mental relief, and then that's when the question gets answered am I safe? When they have time to seek mental relief, that question gets answered. And then when that question gets answered, that's when learning really happens from the, the point of release until we start again. That window is, is that learning window. So, right, there's, there's a lot of times we'll, we'll do something and we get the release. We're like, oh, good. You, that was the thing. But then too often our mind just starts patterning. It's like, okay, well, I got to hustle and go do the other side. I didn't give that horse time to seek mental relief. And that's when the licking and chewing happens is in that seeking mental relief. So slowing down, Paula, like you said, slow down faster to get done sooner. The more time I give my horse in that seeking mental relief range, the more learning that's happening. So I, I, I tease people or if you drive past my place, you'll see me a whole lot of times standing there, staring at yeah, a horse with right. a lead rope on the ground, and I'm just standing there. Yes. And I tease you around. I'm like, people pay me to teach the horse to do nothing. 
Right. And then they pay me to stand here and look at their horse while the horse is doing nothing. Right. Right. <laughs> but that's the learning. That's what it's really happening. And so, man, we do a little thing, back up, wait, and wait, and wait. But I tell you, it gets done so much faster. Like you said, Paula, it, it really makes the learning happen. There's there's an optimal learning range in horse behavior. And Dr. Peters designed this. He's got a pyramid that shows all these behaviors. And there's an optimal learning range right in the middle. And that's really where we want to be working with our horses. And that's when they're, you know, they're not too cautious that they're in that self-preservation that you talked about. But they're also not too relaxed that they're totally not even paying attention or, you know, they're not even in class, right? So we've got to get them in that optimal range. And, and that's, that's when you see me standing around looking at your horse all the time and like, nope, I'm waiting for him to lick and chew. This will be the 112th time he's licked and chewed today. Right. We've learned, we've had 112 learning opportunities instead of 12. Right, 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 exactly. So, oh, I'm sorry, do you want to go? Well, I was going to ask about eye rolling, like if a horse gets kicked or if a horse, you know, obviously like say they, they bop their head, they, they slam their nose into the stall wall or something, you'll see them lift and roll their eye and obviously they're in pain but what's going on inside their head when they're rolling their eye. And then the other one would be um, when the lip comes up and they're smelling like, so I believe flaming, but anyway, what is, what is that? I mean, they're smelling, but can you explain those two, those two sort of physical um, behaviors that, that we see? Yeah. One, I can address a little bit more than the other, just because I'm quick to say when I don't know, man, I'm the first guy to raise my hand and say, you know, I'm, I don't really know because I've gotten in and I see a lot of people get into trouble when they try to do things that they don't really know or they're not really quite that sure about on things. Uh, let's start with the eye rolling. I don't know what it means in a sense in, in like a pain or in kind of a reset that way, but if you watch when they, right before they go into that, that yawning stage, if you're watching their eyes, boy, you'll see that third eyelid kind of roll over and, and you'll see their eyes just roll back in their head. It's like there's, <laughs> they can feel it coming on. They're like, well, what is happening? And those eyes start to roll around. So in that setting, that's in the beginning of that opioid release. And they're, they're really just, their, their brain is just like, wow, I can't believe, you know, they're just really down regulating. Um, so in that sense, that's how I read it that way. I don't know scientifically, like if they bump or bang on something, I don't, I don't know. So I'll just leave that at that. Um, but that, and that, that Fleming response, when they curl that lip up and they, they pinch those nostrils down tight, they're trapping those, those pheromones, those molecules that they, they captured in the air. And the sense of smell goes directly to the brain. It doesn't go through any processing centers or, or any evaluative centers. That sense of smell is a direct connect to the brain. And so when they can trap that in there, I mean, they're, they're reading so much data from that smell of, and if it's, you know, a, a stallion or in, a, in that sense, you know, they can tell whether the mares are ready to breed or, or how old or how long ago this scent was left here. You know, they're, they're reading just a bunch of information in that. And I, I see horses kind of doing that in, in the training in a sense too with, with me and interacting with me a little bit. I don't know what they're doing in that sense when it's with me, but as I watch horses on their own, you know, doing that, it, it's very related to, to breeding in a sense a lot with, with the stud horses or even, you know, some of the, the mares and just kind of how they're capturing or reading, I think, the, the sense or the wellness of whatever that other horse, you know, the smell that they've got. So I'll stay because I just haven't dove into that. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Then my, my question would be, um, you know, sometimes you see these horses that have been with their person for a very long time and they are just shut down. They haven't been listened to. Maybe their question about, is, am I safe, has not been addressed ever. And the horse is just in complete, like, internalized tolerance mode. Where do you go with people like that and their horses? For sure. And I, I've experienced horses in this setting in, in a couple of different ways. One way in describing that can be a horse that has been maybe very, very abused, very just, it's just been traumatized or it's been under so much pressure. And, and on this, this pyramid of behaviors at the very top of the pyramid is panic, right? And so if that horse has gone clear to the top of the pyramid and then been in panic and then still not been able to get released, you know, whatever the pressure is, 
and, and I see this a lot of times and, you know, we call it desensitizing in the industry. I see a lot of that happening way too long. You know, we're, we're, we're flagging that horse. You know, I'll do it as just seconds because they get up and alert. I want to come down and let them reset. When they stay up there too long and too long and too long, and if it really gets into a fight mode or a fight mode and they can't get out of that, they go past panic on that pyramid, and then they go over to the other side of the pyramid, which Dr. Peters calls the dark side. And, and when a horse goes to the dark side, if, if you guys have you know, worked with some rehabilitation type setting situations, when the horse goes to the dark side, you're past training and you're now into rehabilitation. And boy, that's, that can take a lot of time. And you may not be able to get a horse completely out of that. They, that's a bad thing. That's really a bad thing when they hit that dark side from being overpressured in a traumatic type situation. I've got a horse here in training right now that, that isn't that, but this horse is very disconnected from humans, meaning this horse just avoids and is just really quiet and just shut down, doesn't engage, doesn't really even look at you when you're doing anything. And so this horse is different. And this one we have a lot of experience with in that, you know, clients aren't aware that their horse needs these resets, you know, needs these little moments to kind of recover from the stress. And so the horse becomes so tolerant that it just starts turning off and turning off, turning off and turning off and to where, and unfortunately you see this a lot in, in dude horses, you know, on new string or, 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 you know, you go do a, a tourist ride where a lot of times those horses are just so shut off and they just have nothing to say because they've been nose to tail for 10 years there's no communication needed. You know, they're just a zombie in a sense doing their job. Right. Yeah. Man, interaction, you know, building some curiosity and, and, you know, doing some things that can help engage that horse's uh, curiosity. And, and so this horse that we have here is just getting her to look at me has been a big deal. Right. To get her to just have eyes on me and then stay there long enough that she can relax. And so I do a lot of games with her in the round pen. I'll, have her out there and, and then I'm, you know, body language around kind of pressure release. And when she'll look at me, I release the pressure and just kind of drop back a little bit. And I'm just trying to keep her attention on me long enough that she can relax and lick and chew. Cause now that, that behavior of, of paying attention all of a sudden felt good. Dopamine rewards behavior. So dopamine causes, you know, this feel good feeling. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting this horse in a sense, addicted to paying attention because paying attention feels better than the stress worry. So I we're playing a lot of games with her and a lot of things to just, Hey, look at me and relax. Hey, look at me and relax. And one of my other trainers assistants has, has been working with this horse quite a bit. And he came up to me the other day and he says, you wouldn't believe it. Dusty finally looked at me and she like stayed engaged with me and she chewed like four times and stayed looking at me for like five minutes. I mean, he noticed this huge change in her and I was like, dude, you're on the right track. That's it. That's what she needs. Right. She needs to feel comfortable paying attention and being engaged in the relationship. So right. that that's what I would say is we got to get our handlers, right? Us humans way more engaged with what's going on with the horse at a neurochemical level. You know, are they totally shut down? Are they totally cautious? Totally self-preservation? We got to slow that down and, and get some curiosity going, and that'll get some confidence going, and then we can start really communicating and, and really getting somewhere. So it's building that connection, and we got to slow way down, right? And, and yeah, yeah. It, it's lots of trainers. We're, we're 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 discovering this. We're really learning in the last you know ten fifteen years. We got to slow this down. Right. And we'll get a whole lot done faster and we end up riding a much safer horse because we've slowed down and let all that pressure come out instead of by the time we tack and do everything, we're building all that pressure in and then we get on and go for the, the trail ride and, you know, the horse is jigging and jagging for 45 minutes and it's like, oh, he's like this every time. It, I know it'll take a little while and he'll, he'll calm down. Just no, don't worry about me. Right. right. <laughs> 45 minutes later, finally, that horse has calmed down. Let's just get on the horse nice and calm to start with. You know, let's let's break it down beforehand. Exactly. And then it gets where we can go pretty fast, right? When the horse is used to relaxing, we can catch them and brush them and saddle them and, and they can self-regulate. They'll just keep fixing themselves and fixing and fixing and come down and down and down and then they're ready to go.
There it is. Yeah. And what a great way to talk about a horse that, that is disassociated or in the horsemanship world you hear checked out. So you yeah. just sort of explained what's going on when a horse is checking out. And then you gave us something to do with that horse to cause what we want to have happen, which is look to me, get curious about me, get curious about life. We'll go to, you know, come here, let's go encourage that. And what a great way to explain that to people because you see this all the time where horses are checked out. So yeah. that's, that's, that's great. I, yeah. I really yeah, they'll just get chemically, chemically totally checked out. And yeah. so they're just yeah. chemically not even motivated. So they're right. just, right. It, the best thing to do is just ignore. And they're yeah. like, this is where I'm comfortable. I'm <laughs> right. so comfortable in ignoring. Right. <laughs> so, right. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Dopamine. It that made me laugh because you, you said, uh, going under the don't move mean, it made me laugh because you said, get that horse addicted into looking at yeah, you. Yeah, right. I like <laughs> I that, too. That I like funny. that, too. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it, in dealing with these neurochemicals in the brain, I mean, they are drugs. They're very natural drugs. And, and we get addicted, addicted to dopamine as well. I mean, when, when somebody's addicted to, to cocaine or to drugs, they're not really addicted to the cocaine. They're addicted to the dopamine that they, that, that drug releases. Well, we can release that in our horse and ourselves very naturally. We just have to find that path, right? Instead of it being a, a you know, a, a chemical input from the outside, it's a, it's a chemical release in the brain. And I, once these horses, they, they really do get addicted. They get addicted to learning because they start to feel good. They, they get rewarded for that behavior of curiosity. And once they get rewarded for being curious enough times, I can take a running chainsaw out into my round pan, ring, and I'll have horses come over and be like, what the hell is that? Because yeah. they're, they're, they're just like, I know if I'm curious, I'm going to feel good. So they'll come and be curious or, or an air compressor, you know, an air chuck off of an air hose. Yeah. <laughs> the horse is like, what's that? You know, and they want to come over because their caution has gone down because they've been rewarded for being curious so many times. They're like, I'm addicted to being curious. Now, they might not come right over, but that's where I'm kind of leading to it is I want to get them, I want to get them addicted to, to dopamine, which means they're addicted to down-regulating. When a horse can self-regulate, that's, that's what we call a bomb-proof horse or, you know, he's a great kid horse. That's a horse that just knows how to self-regulate. Right. That horse is known, he's just figured out how to take care of himself and come down and come down. Right. Right. And the horses that are just crazy those horses are upregulated and they don't know how to come down. That, you know, and that's our role as handlers and trainers is, here, let me show you. Let's, let, like you said, Paula, let's slow down. And then that horse can start to think about curiosity. But if they're cautious, curiosity is nowhere on the option list. It's, it's down here. They got to calm down and then they can go, what about curiosity? And that makes all the difference as, as you can, you know, you can get a horse to, you know, we just call it want to, right? When I take a horse up to the horse trailer and they want to be curious, we, we've taken Mustangs that have never been trailer loaded other than being stampeded on at the BLM, right? And that all happens. And then we get them to our facility and we go through the science-based training and get their mind so relaxed. By the time we take them over to the trailer for the first time to do trailer loading, I can just stand at the trailer and allow them to be curious. And I've got it on numerous videos of trailer loading a wild horse for the first time. They self load because they're so addicted to being curious. They're like, well, normally I'd be cautious, but I know that being curious feels better. And man, they just go to the trailer. I've had to stop them a couple of times. I'm like, hang on, I'm trying to do a video here of teaching this. Stop already. Don't get in. But that's, that's the beauty of the science is their brain just gets chemically dependent on wanting to of being curious of investigating and that answers the question of am i safe and when that question is answered man you and your horse are unstoppable right away you go right that's yeah. awesome thank you yeah. yeah yeah so cool this is a this is just a, a great interview i i learned a lot and i'm sure everybody that's watching has learned a ton and well i know i know i've learned a ton i'm I'm in the learning model just all the time with this and, and study, you know, with Dr. Peters, I call him fairly regular and, and ask him some, some questions about things. And uh, we're now starting to do some research on uh, variable heart rates. So not the beats per minute, but we're, we're starting to look into this heart rate variability 
and, and that's connected to our autonomic nervous system. You know, there's tons of this with humans and very little, if any, on horses. So now I've, I've got a variable heart rate monitor that I put on my horses. And so now I can watch in live time what that stress level is with a digital number on my phone instead of looking at the horse and kind of trying to read it and then feel we have a live digital readout now, but we're early in that. And uh, that's about all I dare say right now because I'm just, we're learning how that works. But what I'm seeing with that is even when I am now thinking the horse is pretty relaxed and then I take a look, I'm like, I think I'll wait another 60 seconds. Right. And then I wait another 60 seconds. I'm like, Yep, way more relaxed than what I thought. And so it's just really helping quantify this in technology rather than a, a feeling in a sense. Right, right. That's great. Yeah, that is so cool. So, you know, a quick question in regards to that, that um, and you might be able to shed some light on it. I read a while back, they had done a study on heart rate variability with humans and horses and how horses and humans um, will start to sync up a little and, and the horses can actually bring the human's heart rate down. Can you expand on that at all? Do you? We're just barely coming into that exactly. I'm okay. working with another neuroscientist and, and he's kind of helping get that data to us and, and us to understand that. But there is this uh, lower heart rate frequency that is, that is a common frequency between horses and humans. And I'm, Please, I'm very elementary at this. So if I'm off a little, it's because I just don't know. So I'll, I'll, I'll quantify this with saying, first, I don't know. <laughs> and then we'll kind of trip along with, with what we're playing with. And so as the horse wants to you know, connect with that, that same heart rate frequency, right? If, if we as humans are too far out of that range, imagine what that feels like for the horse from an autonomic nervous system of, I can't connect, I can't communicate, I can't resonate with, with this being caution uh -huh. right and so then that horse can, becomes cautious but those really good therapy horses right those horses that are just really calm in their being that horse can hang out and wait for the human yes keep relaxing human keep relaxing we'll find our connection here and, and i think that's why equine therapy is is so valuable and i i feel that's where it really happens but again this is just me west taylor the cowboy talking and <laughs> right a long ways to go that's but I'm, it's so fun. It is so fun to be investigating this stuff. So I love the question, Paula, and I think science will, will bring us more as, as time goes. Right. Yeah. yeah, well, it sounds like you're kind of on the forefront of this, experimenting with some new technology and stuff. So I can't wait to hear yeah, more, more from you more. as you yeah. learn. And yeah, we love it. <laughs> We're having some fun, and uh, I, I wish we had, you know, this isn't funded by anything. This is just me out playing around and then I get some data and talk to some neuroscientists on the phone that are, that are graceful enough with their time and their knowledge to help me interpret it. So right. it's very just backyard cowboy, but it's, it's, we're finding some cool stuff that, that really makes sense. Explain the picture with you in the grocery store with your horse. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. Yes. Great question. And uh, so Carhartt clothing company, uh, sent one of their photographers out to our place to do a, a photo shoot for their clothing line. And so it's pretty cool. They sent us cases of Carhartt clothing. So man, I got a bunch of Carhartt gear. It's super cool. Yeah. And, but the photographer, uh, Elliot Ross, super talented photographer. So shout out to him, but he was at the ranch there and we'd shot around the mountains and with cows and rivers and all these different shots. And he was like, man, I just feel like there's just, I don't know, there's just maybe one shot that I don't, just something that's kind of spectacular or something. And I was like, man, I don't know, dude, we've been out cliff jumping and running through rivers and, you know, doing some pretty crazy stuff. And, and then I sink in and, and, and I was like, well, I, I got an idea and I got a friend, right? I got a friend that, that has a grocery store. So anyway, he, we did a photo shoot for Carhartt in the grocery store. It was about one o'clock in the morning. So the store was all closed down. And uh, he wanted to have a, you know, we just got some pictures. And so I said, I'll, I'll just take my Mustang. That was my Mustang Cassidy. First Mustang I ever adopted. First horse I ever even thought about training or whatever. And I said, I can, I can do some shopping with her. And so, you know, we, we had to work through this down regulation of up the loading dock in the back, through the big rolling doors, past the big cardboard compaction machine, with, you know, this big scary thing. And, you know, we worked our way in just licking and chewing and licking and chewing and nice and calm. And, 
And uh, yeah, I just kind of rode around the grocery store and, and this photographer was just zinging around taking pictures. And some of the ones that you Great. saw was, you know, him taking those pictures. And, and to me, it said a lot. It wasn't about a, hey, look at me. I'm in the grocery store kind of a thing. But if you just look at the horse, yeah, it's calm. when that answer of safety is properly, when it's answered correctly, it doesn't matter whether I'm in a grocery store or an arena or a mechanic shop or riding in, you know, Right. anywhere right. when our horse's mind is calm and, and in the parasympathetic nervous system and relaxed and they can self-regulate that's how those things can happen so yeah, yeah we didn't do any grocery store training right how would right. you know we no. didn't set aisles up out in the in the round pen and practice that right. that was just a relaxed horse in a chaotic environment finding calmness right and, I, and she nailed it man i, I thought my <laughs> mustang cassidy she she just nailed that i was tense as all get out i'm not gonna lie man my cortisol levels were stressed i was like oh my gosh this is intense wow i've got to just relax so it, it took a lot for me too to just bring, bring down. that down and relax and be calm so it's that's good. kind of the story behind the picture uh, of what that was and uh, yeah it ended up carhartt out there for a whole year, you know, their, their monthly email was going out was, was pictures of me and the Mustangs. And then that was one of them in the grocery store. So it was kind of a cool thing. It's awesome. That's great. I love it. But yeah, yeah so well, we appreciate this. It's great. And yeah, we'd like yeah, to thank you so much. Yeah, Thank you. And we'll, we'll, yeah, hopefully you'll be able to do this again in the near future. And Absolutely. Well, let me know. And I'd love to do whatever I can do and share the science. That's really what my my passion and purpose is right now is is getting this information out there. It's right. I think we're time it is time for that next big thing. And we've all you know, we're all touching on it, but now we're gonna have we have words for it, we have science for it instead of right kind of these horsisms, right? Or these old cowboy things. Or these you know, they have sayings and the sayings are good because it's to teach people, you know, that horse is trying or that horse yes. is you know, don't discourage it from trying, but but it's good because those sayings do help people, but I appreciate you putting the science behind that. Yeah. So thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's, it's made it make a lot of sense to me. I mean, I, you know, those sayings, and I was trying to interpret those. What does all that mean? You know, right. make the right thing easy, one thing hard, and you're like, okay, but I, I get wow. it, kind of, what, how? But, right. boy, once you got the science to it, and it's just like, right. get that horse, you know, wanting to relax, that's, it just helps all the way around. Yeah. So it's a fun thing that I'll, I'll do with my clients in that, you know, let's just say you've got your horse standing in there and, and right. I can take my training stick with a flag on it and just raise it up above my head. Right. Boom. Right. That horse head up, eyes, ears, boom. Everything's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> right. right. Oh, boom. We just hit the sympathetic nervous system. And now just stand back and watch. And if I can get my clients to see, okay, there the head come down a little bit. There, the eyes are blinking a little bit. Oh, now I'm, you know, I saw a bigger breath. Now the ears are kind of floating backwards a little bit. The head comes down even more. Now they're going to cock a hind leg. Right. They're going to take a big breath and then they lick and chew. You know, whatever that sequence is, and each horse has a little different, but when I can get people watching that, the licking and chewing is the confirmation. And and because then you can kind of call it out like, Okay, the horse is going to do this, 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 and this, and then lick and chew, and then just stand back. And boy, when the human can see that happening, and then the horse licks and chews, because right the frontal part of our brain, you need to label it, next, all of that, it just starts matching, and they're like, well, I can do that. You know, they can see that happen. That's, yeah. that's when it gets really fun, is when a client that has never noticed that their horse licked and chewed, half hour later can go, well, now the ears are going to get soft, and then she's going to blink her eyes, and then her tail's going to twitch, and then she's going to cock a hind leg, and then a big breath and lick and chew. Yeah. That's just awesome. It's like now they're connect aware the, of the Connect the dot <laughs> things that they have for kids, right? It's like, yes. <laughs> and then the picture's right there, and it's so clear. <laughs> yep, not, we're much more connected now if we're sitting there engaged watching yes. instead of, I did the thing, and now I'm going to do the thing. We just missed two minutes of connection, of engagement. And when that horse discovers that you don't, you don't connect or engage, then they just start to turn off. Right. Yeah. And, and then over time, you know, you, you just got a horse that tolerates and is just checked out and just stands there. And, yeah. and then it'll blow up later, right? Because it, it got loaded with all this stress. And then 
you know, it's that, it's that one scary shadow out on the trail, right? He's never bolted in a shadow before, but today it was just terrible. I'm like, well, what happened before what happened? Exactly. Right, let's back that up. How many times did he lick and chew before he saw the shadow? Right. Yeah. I don't know. No. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it oh, happened. Fun it stuff. happens. happens right. Uh-huh. That was a saying you'd hear a lot, but yeah. Yeah. It's great. What, what do you yourself, do you do anything else besides horses for, for let's say fun? <laughs> do you have time to have fun? <laughs> um, I'll tell you what I'm, what I'm really getting into that, that is helping me with, with horses a bunch in just the last year is, is physical fitness. And so I turned 49 last December. And when I turned 49, I was like, dang, I am getting like 50 is just right there. I can touch 50. And that was, and I, I told myself, I'm like, man, I want to be fit at 50. Yeah. And so for the last year and four or five months, I've really been getting into you know, CrossFit, healthy eating, yoga, meditation, uh, you know, just lots of internal kind of physical, spiritual, quiet things. I've been doing some of that longer, but boy, the physical part and stretching, flexibility. Right. And, I, and I, I honestly, I'm kind of addicted to it that, that really feels good. And it's helped me so much with the horses to be flexible instead of being chronically stiff and something moves and I can't flow with it because I'm stiff or structured or I'm very tight and tense. So that's, that's been some really fun stuff that I've been engaging with is, and then also in kind of converting what happens with the horse's brain and our brain. So where they, a lot of the similarity is, the horse just doesn't have that prefrontal cortex to lie about what's really happening where we do. (laughs) So when I can watch a horse relax in a very tense environment, I'm like, man, brain functionality, it's possible. So how can I do that in a really tense environment? Mm -hmm. And so I've been uh, taking ice baths is, is one of those super intense environments. And for me to get in an ice bath, and negotiate by flight in my mind and, and turn that off because I, men, as soon as I'm submerged to here in ice, my body is saying, you're going to die right now. You should leave. And I'm like, that's exactly how the horses feel. They feel that same way when they hit a tense environment. How quick can they come down? And so I'm asking myself, how quick can I come down? And so I've been taking the ice, ice baths to really – focus on my mentality of how quick can I not panic? And I tell you, it's given me huge insight to the horses. I really, really can be empathetic with a horse. When, when I unload a horse, a young new horse out of a horse trailer in a new environment, and that horse gets out of the trailer, what do they do? They're like, man, you know, they want to know everything, right? Nobody told the horses that the dinosaurs are extinct. So when they get out of a trailer, they're like, I know there's dinosaurs here somewhere. And they're just like, man, right. I look at that as like the ice bath. I'm like, oh, dude, you just got in the ice bath. Yeah. Let's bring this down. And so I've got a, a meditation process I do with the horses. And I, maybe that's another conversation another time. But yeah, how quick can I get that horse to find me energetically and just come down, come down, come down, come down. And then when the horse is nice and relaxed, I'm like, go ahead and take a look around. Right. You're safe. We're okay here. And so that ice bath has been massively impactful for me to well you guys know Warwick Schiller and I, I saw you had an art time with him and he and I were together up in Utah uh I think about a year and a half ago and he's the one that introduced me to the ice bath and he was studying doing a little bit of the Wim Hof method and and he'd done one ice bath and we were at my place in Utah up in the mountains and I was like dude I want to do an ice bath and he's like well let's get some ice and I go how about we just go chop a hole in the lake? That's what we did. And, you know, let's go up to the lake. <laughs> right. Yeah. Went up to the lake above my house. On the edge was still like slushy. Yeah. It was in March. It had it was like super ice chunks. <laughs> and he took walked me through an ice bath at the lake and one of the most intense experiences of my life. So that's right. that was a cool thing that really shed some light on this is how the horses feel. And it's that rush. It's that rush. I, I, we cut a hole and, uh, took a chainsaw, cut a hole in some ice this year. And oh, we jumped, we jumped in. Not I, I, and we, I mean, fully jumped in and, and, and yeah, it's just, it just hits you just whoosh, but you can you practice bringing it down and we do, we cycle. So we used to, well, we, we still sort of mountain bike race before COVID stuff, but 
at the beginning of the race, it's this big, you want to get in the front because it's open and it's going to funnel down to trees and single trap. And you're just yeah. in this battle and everybody's yeah. excited and people crash at the beginning of the race. And it's like, you feel you have to practice bringing it down and heart rate down. And, and so I can, all that, it helps you understand what is it like for the horse? Yeah. So, so that you're doing yeah. this is what a great way to like learn. What is yeah. it, you know, from the horse's perspective, more from the horse's perspective, I'm trying to say. Yeah. So well, we lead such cushy, comfy lives now. Yeah. So we're never yeah. really, truly in a fight or flight. Right. You know? we, right. And, and yeah, that, that whole ice bath thing. I've listened to some podcasts about, about people that do it and, you know, the, the regulating of it and the meditation through it. And some people do like hot and then the, I, you know, ice bath yeah. and all the, um, all the biology that actually is so beneficial when you are doing these things, because you're really causing your body to have to learn how to adapt and get rid of things that aren't beneficial to you and yeah. hone in on the things that are. And it's, it's interesting because, because I never really thought about how that those ice baths might apply to the horses uh, and where they're at. I didn't, I didn't either until, I did that. And it wasn't even that day. It was a, a, like a week later, I was in a meditation, just calm, quiet myself. And, and that, in, that, that, that thought kind of come to me and that download come in of like, Hey, what you felt in that ice bath, that's what the horses feel. And then the difference between what we call, you know, a, a broke gentle horse is how fast can the horse recover when it gets in the ice, bath, Right. You're walking down the trail and boom, there's that noise over there or that thing or the whatever. How fast can the horse just go, what? You know, how quiet, how fast can they go to zero? That's and that's the same thing with us humans, you know. I mean, our first responders and our cops and law enforcement, military, all those guys are just trained badasses and staying calm under pressure. That's just the difference between, you know, that dude and and the accountant, right? You take, or you take me, you put me out on the battlefield. I'm going to freak, man. Me too. <laughs> Five rounds going past me. I won't be able to write my name. <laughs> I right? But I can stand a dude that, that can stay calm. Yeah. He can freaking read a book and count his heartbeats, right? right. Yeah. That's, it's the, it's the same neurochemicals in our horses. And, and so that's what, it's fun for me to put myself in these different environments to kind of feel that and go, okay. I can be way more empathetic to the horse because now I have a feeling to associate it with instead of, why are you so scared getting out of the trailer? We've been here 10 times at the same trailhead. Come on already. Yes. Well, now I'm like, oh, you just got in an ice bath for the 10th time. I know what that feels like. Let's take a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Let's bring it down. Yeah. Right. Woo. Right. Yeah. No, it's because I promise you, if, if I go jump in an ice bath right now, the first 10 or 15 seconds is complete chaos. <laughs> <laughs> I just need the time to come down. I can't just jump in and, and read a bedtime story, right? And have it be relaxed. No way. No way. So. Well, like you said it, empathy for the horse. So we, you're always talking about feel for the horse and what does the horse need? But yeah, most people, like you said, they're not able to feel for the horse. And so they can't give the horse what it needs. So work on yourself. And that's why I ask what you do for fun. And I can see you look great. You look fit. And that's why I asked that question because physical fitness, it teaches us so much and it's hard to tell somebody you need to get more fit. It, it's fun for me to, to work with the horses and, you know, I do my stretches with the horses. I kick the leg up on the hip and lean in and, you know, put my forehead on my knee or up on the saddle and <laughs> right. people are like, holy cow, you're flexible. I'm like, I'm just serious about what I'm doing. You know, I'm just, I'm into this. I, yeah. I, I want to be fit for the horse so that I can, do the things we need to do and, and be flexible. And yeah, it's just turned into a whole bunch of fun. It's amazing what horses cause us to do. Oh gosh. And not just financially and not just like equipment and vehicles, and, but also learning. Yeah. We, you know, maybe because of horses, you're doing these other things for yourself. Yeah. Spiritually, emotionally, mentally, yeah. physically. I mean, they touch our lives at such a deep level if we allow it, you know, yeah. you have to, but once that true meaning comes in, it really is transformative. Uh, absolutely. And I, 
One last thing, if you don't mind, that the horse helped really teach me. I, I got in a pretty bad wreck with a horse about five years ago and got the whole left side of my face crushed and my skull cracked open. I mean, it was a bad deal. But anyway, I since that point, I was really focused on safety. I was like, I have got to figure some things out because that was just super unfortunate that that happened to me. And I just didn't know enough to have it not happen. So I've, I've really focused on that safety. But what that's meant to me over time, every time I get hurt now, anytime I feel physical pain, a rope burn, a, a nail gets pulled back, uh, I stub my toe, whatever that is. And I started with the horses. Every time I felt pain, I would immediately stop and then rewind my thoughts of what happened before, what was I thinking, what was I thinking before that, where was my mind mentally, and every time I back that up far enough to go, okay, 15 minutes ago when I tipped over that feed sack and dumped all the grain out in the tack room and, ah, oh, geez, you know, I got negative and I was cranky about well, now I got to clean all this up and, you know, maybe another trainer left it in the way and I tripped over it or whatever. But whenever I had that negative thing and then I would start playing it back from there with the awareness of, okay, I was negative here. And then I went here and did this and said that and thought this. And then I went here and did this and said this and thought this. And then, and then, and then I got stepped on. Okay. So there's the pain. There's the thought. And every time I'd rewind that back and be conscious of that thought, I've experienced so much less pain. <laughs> like rarely do I get a rope burn. Do I pull a nail back on the saddle because a horse is jumping or moving around or something? I'm just so much more aware of what's going on up here so I can stay slow. And then I've taken that and incorporated it into my everyday life with my wife, my kids, my neighbors, my friends. When I feel that negative thought coming up, I'm like, okay, I can keep thinking this and I'll probably experience pain in a little while. Or I can change this thought, let me relax and downregulate, let me lick and chew, right. and then go through my day. That has changed so much for me in what's going on up here. I'm way more conscious of it. Because with the horses, it just becomes super real. You're doing stuff with a 1,200-pound animal that has the fastest reflexes on the planet, and I have zero chance of getting out of the way. I really need to be conscious of what I'm doing. Yeah. 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 And so that is just like, – when I'm with a horse, I am with that horse. The, my wife can talk. At the, I, I'm gone. Right. There, there is no multitask. That's one thing. One drawback I've learned with working with horses – my multitasking capabilities suck. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot multitask anywhere near as good as I used to because I was so distracted and fragmented. Yeah. I'd have my head in this thing and that thing and this thing and that thing. Boy, now when I'm out with a horse, it's 100%. Nothing else exists. Yeah, I've missed phone calls and appointments and important things, whatever, just because I've been so there. But yeah. my injury level has gone to nearly zero. And that's what's important. That's what I really like. Yeah, that's that's pretty neat. Yeah, that's a really cool story. It's a cool that's story. Right with wild horses. I mean, we're, right. we're wild horses is our normal every day. Yes. That's pretty critical. That I, I mean, it, right. a, a sprained ankle puts me out of business. I know. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just okay. Let's just stay safe then. Yeah. Let's just yeah. not have that ever happen. And how do we do that? we got to be 100% connected with the horse and be 100% focused and be there. Right. And then that relates into people. When I'm engaged and talking with my wife and out to dinner with my wife or something, I'm like 100% there. I'm, I can't get on my phone. It drives me bonkers to even have a text come in because I, like I said, you're, my multitasking has gone away. I can't do it. Very good. Yeah. People that lived 100 years ago, they were more like that. They were more in the moment and present because they didn't have a hospital to go to if their horse stepped on their foot. And, or when you go ride, and we like to do this too, we just want to do this more. But when we go ride rough terrain, go yeah. out in the mountains and ride, you're in the moment. You have to be. You're focused. You're yes. focused now. Yeah. And, it's, and I mean, there is no multitasking because this is real. We need to do this. 
And maybe that's why we like to mountain bike race or maybe whatever. A hundred percent. Right. Yeah. You're, right. You're, 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 your, yes. your subconscious becomes so engaged with what's going on. So I, I like trail running, right? So I'm running on uneven terrain, rocks, bushes, cactuses, and stuff. I love that because my mind gets so, just like mountain biking. I don't mountain bike, but if you lose focus, you're going to feel pain. Right. That's <laughs> <how it> goes, <laughs> right? <laughs> so when I'm out jogging and running on that trail, and I'm, I'm just feeling how I'm going along, I'm like, man, Wes, did you feel how your left foot sprung a little more to get you over that rock? You didn't have to think about it. You didn't have to analyze it. It just happened live time. Yes. That's that's the parasympathetic nervous system. Even though you're you're you're, you're stressed, you're doing something. You're responsive. You're a hundred percent engaged. You're there. You know, you can't do that and then look down and look at the text message that come in. If you got your phone on your bike, right? You look down for a text message. The next thing you're going to see is an EMT, right? You're like, oh, okay, you're fixing me. Right. A hundred percent, man. That's, yeah. that's where it's at. Yeah. I mean, I, we could go on for hours with you, but you know, maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe someday we can get our horses out there. Who knows? Well, yeah, so. get it going. And, and it, if you want, well, I mean, people can find, you know, more about me online, Facebook, Instagram, my website, okay. uh, you know, West Taylor, W E S T like the direction. That's my first name. Yes. And, uh, and then my website is West taylor.net and kind of see what we got going on there and we've got a, a an online video library walking through this science from starting a wild horse at zero all the way through saddling and riding and and all the way through using science every step of the way and uh anyway people can find more there i'd love to have them uh, join us there thank you yes. and thank you to everybody who's either listening or watching this right now